thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna motivate this talk in just one slide, and that's this slide. So very recently, <laughs> uh, Google announced that they achieved quantum supremacy, which basically just means that, so they claim to have solved the computation on a quantum chip in less time than it takes to solve it on the best supercomputer we have today. And kind of, I'm not t asking you to take a stance on this, it's basically irrespective of whether you believe this or not. It highlights a problem that th people have been thinking about for a while, which is how do we verify the results of general quantum computations? Or rather, how do we efficiently verify these results? And that's basically what I'm going to be talking about. So the general idea is that we as non-quantum beings, as classical users, are the verifiers, and the quantum computer is a prover, and we take as input some quantum circuit that we want to delegate to this quantum computer, <clears throat> And we do this by interacting with the computer, so by exchanging messages with it. And at the end, we want to be able to verify the results that are produced by this quantum circuit or by the quantum computer. This is what we call a verification protocol for quantum computation. So the input is the quantum circuit, and the input length will be, say, the number of gates in this circuit. Let's say it has G gates, so the input length will be G. And because we want everything to be efficient, we want the runtime of the verifier the runtime of the prover when it's behaving honestly, as well as the total amount of communication in the protocol to scale polynomially with the number of gates in the circuit, so polynomially in the size of our input. And say that we do this, we run this protocol and we get some answer, in this case 42. Um, what we want is that when the answer really is 42, the verifier accepts with very high probability, so when it gets the correct answer, this is the completeness property of our protocol, and when the answer is not 42, it should reject with very high probability, and this should be the soundness of the protocol. So in addition to, to these uh, parameters of the protocol, there are also some other features that we might require for this to be useful in practice. So in particular, if we want to run this, say, over a quantum computer that's available uh, on the internet, we want the communication to be completely classical, so to involve only exchanging classical bits of information with the quantum computer. Um, we'd like the protocol to be as efficient as possible, and you know, not just in the complexity theoretic sense that everything is polynomial, but we might actually care what those polynomials are, what the exponents are, what the prefactors are, so we just want everything to run as efficiently as possible. And a property that you might want if you care about privacy is known as blindness, and roughly this means that the computation, so the quantum circuit, will not be revealed to the prover throughout the interaction with it, and a bit more formally, it means that if you imagine that you have some probability distribution over the possible inputs, and say all circuits of the same size, having the same number of gates, then it should be that um, after interacting with the verifier, the prover's probability distribution, this conditional distribution after seeing the transcript of the protocol, should be roughly the same as the original prior distribution on the circuits. So the subscript C there means statistical distance, so the two probability distributions should be close in total variation distance, and this we would refer to as information theoretic blindness. But in, as we'll see, what, what we'll actually achieve is computational blindness, where the two probability distributions are merely computationally indistinguishable for all polynomial time quantum algorithms. So this is what we mean by computational blindness. And lastly, a, a property that we want, especially when we have certain cryptographic elements, is known as composability. And this just says that we can use this protocol as a black box and be able to compose it with other protocols. So take the output of some other protocol and plug it into this one, or plug the output of this one into another one, things of this nature. Okay, so what do we know about, about verification? Well, if you look at the literature prior to 2018, there were basically three main approaches to this problem. So one class of protocols were called prepare and send protocols. So these were protocols where the verifier did need to have some small quantum capability. In this case, the ability to send single qubit states to the prover. Uh, you can think of this as having some sort of laser that is able to send polarization states of light to the prover, 
And after these states were sent to the prover, then the two entities interact only classically and verification is achieved. And what's really nice is that these protocols usually achieve all of the properties I mentioned on the previous slide. So they're blind, they're very efficient, communication and overhead is linear in the size of the computation. And the only downside is that we have this initial round of quantum communication in the beginning. Then there's a kind of dual to this, which are called receive and measure protocols. So these are protocols where now the verifier should be able to receive these, say, photon states from the prover and be able to measure, say, the polarization at different angles, different directions. And lastly, um, as you heard in Anand's talk yesterday, there are these entanglement-based protocols where now the verifier is completely classical, but it has to interact with two or more quantum provers that are not communicating, but they're sharing quantum correlations known as entanglement. Okay, but the elephant in the room is, what about when the verifier is completely classical and we have a single quantum computer? So if you were at last year's Fox, you know that this was one of the best paper awards from that year. So this was solved by Urmila Mahadev last year. And her protocol is based on this computational or say cryptographic assumption. So we assume that the uh, prover is only running in polynomial time. It's a polynomial time quantum computer. And we assume that this problem known as learning with errors is intractable for polynomial time quantum algorithms. There should be no polynomial time quantum algorithm that can solve this problem. <clears throat> So I'm not going to go through all of her protocol, but I'm just going to mention the key feature of her protocol that is also relevant in our setting. And that is she basically designs a scheme for classically committing to a quantum state. So let me explain what that means. So these are our two parties, the verifier and the prover. And the prover has, let's say, a single qubit state, which we denote as psi. And what we're going to try to do is um, essentially force the prover to commit to this quantum state. And the commitment will be classical, so it will just be a classical bit string. And when we open the commitment, it's going to involve measuring the quantum state. So because measuring quantum states can be done in many different ways, like again, if you think about polarization, it's like measuring in different polarization directions. Um, the verifier is going to have a choice to open the commitment in either, say, the x direction or the z direction. And so the way the protocol is going to work is the verifier is going to generate two pairs of a public key and private key, each one corresponding to the two possible directions in which we want to measure the qubit. So we have a pair for the x direction and a pair for the z direction. And these depend on some security parameter lambda that depends on the uh, cryptographic protocol that we're designing. So we're going to require <clears throat> that the distributions over the public keys are computationally indistinguishable from each other, which means that when we send the public key to the prover, the prover will not know which type of measurement the verifier is instructing it to perform. So I'm just going to use this shorthand notation. So the index D labels the possible direction that we can have. And the verifier just sends the public key to the prover. And then the prover is instructed to run this algorithm, this commitment algorithm, which is an efficient quantum algorithm that is applied to the quantum state, the state psi that it needs to commit to. It takes in also the public key sent by the verifier, and it produces two things. So it produces a classical bit string C, which is the classical commitment string that is then sent to the verifier. And it also produces a new quantum state psi, which the prover will then use to also produce the reveal string when we want to reveal the commitment. So now that the commitment was sent to the verifier, the prover is not able to change its mind about what state it prepared in the beginning. And the verifier can essentially test this with a number of challenges that it can send to the prover. So the verifier can essentially choose here to either test the prover with the, these challenge and response rounds, uh, where it can either accept or reject. And provided that it accepts, so let's condition on accepting in these challenges, the other choice for the verifier is to ask the prover to open the commitment. And when it does this, the prover will measure this quantum state that it got from the commitment algorithm and produce some other bit string R, which it then sends to the verifier. And the property here is that if the verifier opens the commitment and the reveal string, <clears throat> If the initial choice was, say, the x direction, then opening this commitment should be distributed in the same way as an x measurement of the original state of the prover. And if you open it in the z direction, then it should be a, correspond to a z measurement of that qubit, so be distributed in that way. 
Okay, so what this protocol allows you to do is to essentially certify two types of measurements on a quantum state, in this case, these X and Z measurements. And as I said, the prover essentially doesn't learn which measurement was performed. And this is true even after the reveal phase was performed. So the prover just never learns what measurement was performed. And moreover, it also doesn't learn the measurement outcome um, of this measurement. So using this, this commitment scheme, um, Mahadev then designs the actual protocol that can verify any quantum computation, any polynomial size quantum computation. And the nice thing about this, this uh, protocol that results in the end is that it involves only classical communication with the prover. And as far as we can tell, learning with errors is a hard problem. So we should be good in that respect. But there are also some not so great aspects about it, which is that um, you kind of have to believe me that her protocol is very monolithic and not very easy to modify. And it's also not very clear if it's composable in the sense that I mentioned previously. It's also not blind, so the circuit will be revealed to the prover when we actually delegate the computation to it. And finally, the efficiency is kind of, you know, so and so. So the overall overhead of the prover scales is like the cube of the size of the circuit that we're delegating to it. So our goal was to essentially address all of these not so good aspects and turn them into good aspects. So get rid of all the knots in front of these three uh, sentences. So the way we did this is by looking back at one of these other protocols that I, I mentioned before, specifically this protocol of Fitzsimmons and Kashefi. So as I said, this protocol runs in linear time, it's blind, it's composable, and the only downside is that it has this quantum communication. So if we look closely at what the quantum communication is, each state that the verifier needed to send to the prover in this protocol is just one of 10 possible states, which we can represent as points on a sphere, which is called the block sphere. So the poles of the block sphere are these zero and one states. And then on the, in the equatorial plane, we have eight states that are separated by angles of pi over four equally spaced out. And they're basically just superpositions of zero and one, linear combinations of the two. Again, you can think of all of this in terms of just states of different states of polarization of light. So <clears throat> in, that, in that respect, um, to, to, each, to each pair of, well, sorry, to, to each direction of polarization, you will have two possible states. So for instance, for the Z polarization direction, if you think about it like that, you have these pole states of the sphere, the zero and the one states. These are, these are the states that you can filter through your polarizer. And then for each of the other states, there's also a corresponding measurement or observable. So you have like the X direction, the Y direction, X plus Y and X minus Y. So, uh, Mahadev's commitment scheme only worked for the Z and X directions. And what we did was to essentially modify the commitment scheme to extend it with these additional directions as well. So Y, X plus Y, and X minus Y. And I should mention one more thing here. In this fitzsimmons kashefi protocol, if you're wondering what is the choice for each one of these qubits, like whether it's a zero, one state or one of the states in the equatorial plane, um, depending on the size of the computation that you have, each qubit is either a uniformly random zero or one state, so one of the pole states, or it's uniformly at random one of the states in the equatorial plane. So it's just a choice between whether it's a Z basis state or a state in the equatorial plane, but after that it's just uniformly at random. <clears throat> so this was the protocol from before, the commitment procedure from before, and we basically changed it in three places. So the choice that the verifier now makes, the D, is still between two things, but rather than say Z and X, it's just Z and the equatorial plane because we either wanna prepare one of these Z basis states or a state in the equatorial plane. We need to change the way we challenge the prover because we, we've extended the scheme with these additional measurements. And also because we only care about preparing these specific states, we're actually gonna fix the qubit that the prover has to commit to, and we also change the commitment procedure correspondingly to, to match all of this. So the end result is going to be that when the verifier chooses this Z direction, the state that the prover will end up having is uniformly at random either zero or one, and if the, if the verifier chose X, Y, then it's going to get one of the eight equatorial states uniformly at random. And crucially, the prover will not know what state it got at the end of the interaction with the verifier. So this is what we call remote state preparation. This protocol that we define is what we refer to as remote state preparation. 
So let me give you some ideas about how, how we prove that this works. So first of all, <clears throat> we can use similar ideas to those used by Mahadev and also Brakirsky et al. in a certifiable randomness paper to certify that the prover is correctly performing the measurements in the x and z directions. And if we look more closely, what Mahadev's scheme and this other scheme are actually doing is they're certifying orthogonal directions. So directions on the block sphere that are perpendicular to each other. So we can use this to certify not just z and x, but also z and y, z and x plus y, and z and x minus y. So basically, z and all the directions that lie in the equatorial plane. But this uh, leaves a question about what about these uh, directions in the xy plane that are not necessarily orthogonal to each other. So for instance, um, x and x plus y form an angle of pi over 4 with respect to each other. And how do we check that this, this angle is actually satisfied with the observables that the prover is performing? So to do this, we, we actually use a nice geometric argument that relies on quantum random access codes. So very briefly, a quantum random access code, specifically a 2 to 1 quantum random access code, is a scheme for encoding two classical bits into one qubit. So the idea is that you would have two algorithms, an encoding algorithm that takes two classical bits and produces one qubit, and a decoding algorithm that takes an index i, so one or two, and also the quantum state, so the qubit state, and it should produce the uh, requested bit bi that was encoded in this quantum state. Now, you cannot achieve this perfectly, so even quantum information cannot store more, or say one qubit cannot store more than two classical bits um, in its state. However, what quantum mechanics allows you to do is to get this uh, higher success probability than you would be able to do classically, uh, which is about 85%, so it's cosine squared pi over eight. So, and you can assume here, for instance, that the classical bits were chosen uniformly at random. So in this setting, you can achieve a scheme that has this success probability in encoding and decoding the classical information. So what we showed is that this optimal strategy that achieves this value is unique up to some notion of isometry. And we also showed this in a robust sense. So even if you're achieving, say, close to 85% success probability in your encoding and decoding, then you should be close to performing the optimal strategy in, in your quantum random access code. Um, so how does this work very roughly? So the idea is that suppose we ran the protocol from before with the prover, and it happened that the prover got one of these four states, so one of the states either along the x or the y direction. The verifier knows which state the prover should have obtained, but the prover does not know this. So we're going to view this as two classical bits being encoded in the state that the verifier, that, sorry, that the prover received. And you can see that if we want to request the first bit from this state, then this, the optimal thing for the prover to do would be to measure along this direction, x plus y. Why? Because if, say, the first bit is zero, so the state is either plus or plus pi over two, then you'll be very close to the tip of x plus y, and the angle in between the states there is pi over four, and quantum mechanics tells you that if you were to perform that measurement, the probability that you get the plus, the, say, the zero outcome in, in that measurement is cosine squared of half of the angle that you make with those states. So it's gonna be cosine squared pi over eight, which is the optimal probability. And the same argument holds if you want the, the uh, if, you, if your bit is one. And if you wanna request the other bit, the second bit, then you should measure along this direction, the x minus y direction. And this also holds if you rotate everything by pi over four. So if the prover got one of these other four states instead, then we would just ask it to measure that qubit in either the x or y directions. And because of this um, uniqueness of this optimal strategy, we see that if the prover is succeeding with close to the optimal probability, then it must be performing these observables correctly, which is what we wanted to check. So the resulting protocol is basically this. We're essentially simulating the preparation of states in the prover system. And then because we're doing this, we can then just run this fitzsimmons kasheffi protocol with the prover. And so we get a protocol where we have a classical client. It's composable. It's blind in a computational sense. And efficiency is, you know, it's kind of a maybe because we actually get a slightly worse overhead than in Mahadev's protocol. It's order g to the fourth. 
But the important thing to stress here is that this G to the fourth is only in the remote state preparation part of the protocol. So you can imagine that we do that in the beginning, and then when you run the actual quantum computation, that's only going to require linear time and linear communication. And we have some ideas for how to reduce this, so we actually think that you can make this linear as well. But that's um, for future work. <clears throat> okay, so to conclude, um, the, the main point was to essentially extend uh, Mahadev's commitment scheme to include these additional observables. And this kind of lets us do this remote state preparation, which is a way of kind of dequantizing quantum communication in protocols. And this lets us obtain this protocol, which is blind, verifiable, and composable. And, you know, as open problems, can we improve efficiency is obviously the, the first thing that we would think of. And also, is it possible to extend the commitment scheme in a more direct way? So the verifier was not really choosing any of the observables in the equatorial plane. Those were kind of chosen at random. Um, and we don't really know if it's possible for her to actually choose one of the measurements there explicitly. And finally, because we're dequantizing quantum communication, another interesting direction would be to apply this technique to other protocols that use quantum communication. So say protocols for secure multi-party quantum computation. Okay, so that's it. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>